uh, we will uh, decide on children's camp. Uh, if you've not heard, Jasper County here in Carthage has had a huge influx of the virus. Uh, they have jumped, uh, I, look, I just looked before we got on, they're up over 200 cases. So that's almost a plus 200 in less than five days. Wow. Um, and so um, it, it's looking like if, if we had the same multiplication uh, by tomorrow morning, we probably will have to dismiss children's camp just because this is the center of that apex that's going on. And uh, we can't afford to bring kids in here and then send them out from the center of it. So um, Dustin and I and um, a couple other people will make a couple decisions um, tomorrow morning. But right now, uh, with that number exploding again today, it looks like children's camp will not happen and I'm sorry to all of you who have kids who are planning on coming uh, but we just we just feel like that would be a very dangerous situation to be in we did just finish teen camp we had 160 the first week 210 the second week and we have several that are planning on coming in um, to a week that's in July I call it a free week it's just an open week for any church that wants to come in and um, so that will be taking place so it looks like Amidst the virus, we have potential to hit over 400 in teen camp, which would be about 130 or so less than last year, which is uh, outstanding. So we're very, very grateful um, for all of that. Then um, the last Sunday night in July uh, would, would have been district assembly, as many of you know. And so what, we, what we've done is I have recorded my report. It's in two segments. One is a vision casting segment, and one is a thank you and has um, all of the Nazarene info on it. So it's, it has all the numbers on it. And honestly, uh, I've told somebody yesterday, uh, we were headed towards a record year in almost every category that we had. We, had, we would have had record giving in giving. We would have had a record uh, in attendance average. We actually, we ended with um, a record attendance average, and uh, we would have had had we had Easter, folks, we would have had our thousand. Yeah, um, yeah. We're close. But yeah. Easter, no Easter across the district, uh, those three months really hurt us. We're very close. Um, and, we'll, and I'll announce that number on the report. But we, I'll just tell you right up front, we were, we were really close. And so it's, it was a very good year for us across the board. Great things going on. Uh, of course, the virus has put a clamp on a lot of things. And we'll just keep fighting through. And uh, the Lord will help us with all of that. Okay, so uh, we've asked uh, David Graves, who is General Superintendent, Church of the Nazarene, has been a pastor, has been head of the SDMI uh, Sunday School, uh, helped out with uh, us in those areas, and then has been elected to this position. He's got some young'uns, and he's got some kids, as uh, some folks would call them. Yeah. If I had Ron Jackson here, he'd have more names than that for him. <laughs> but uh, we're so grateful that uh, Brother Dave is coming with us tonight, joining us. And so thanks uh, to our general superintendent for being with us. So let's have a quick word of prayer. We'll ask the Lord to help us, and then we'll move on. Jesus, we love you tonight. We thank you that you love us. We're grateful for that. We thank you that you want to speak into our hearts and our lives tonight across our district. And so we pray that uh, you will use Brother David to do what you want to happen tonight in our lives. And we will submit to you. And to your way, in the powerful name of Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So uh, just a quick reminder, go ahead and mute your, uh, your computers or your phones, wherever you're at. That'll help us out with the sound. So just go ahead and mute that. And uh, if you don't, we'll probably will have, um, I'll have Brother Bill uh, probably mute you if uh, there's noise coming through. All right. So Brother Graves, it's all yours. Great. Well, maybe I should help you that... Uh, Maybe what you should do is take the Easter attendance from last year, add that into your average, and see where that gets you. Uh, that that might be one option. Uh, take last year's month and then put put it into this year's. I think most people would say that's fine. Uh, in fact, I think some districts are doing that uh, oh, really? to help them because the Easter attendance really does uh, affect our overall average. And so to, to try to compare apples to apples, you really need an Easter attendance in there for this year 
yeah. uh, to even be comparing to last year. Mm -hmm. So, well, congratulations to all of you and thank you for the ministry that you are doing and for how you have quickly adapted to uh, the new way of doing things. I'm wondering how many of you uh, have already started back having services at, at the building? We have in Buffalo. Okay, good. Most of you have. How have they been going? Okay. We're going great for us. I mean, we're, we're, we're truly blessed. We've actually had some new people coming. But that's uh, due in large part to the food giveaways we've been doing and the partnership we've, we've had with Convoy of Hope. Great. That's great. Well, we'd be interested in hearing how maybe we'll have a little time for you to share some of the things you've been doing uh, as you've come back in. I know there's a lot of work and churches that are having to take pews out and the, and the spreading out like uh, one person said their church usually seats 300 and they can only have a hundred in there now uh, because of the spacing but uh, we are definitely in some new days and I'd like to just direct your attention to God's Word tonight for a few moments if you have a Bible close by or if you have your phone uh, with the scripture on it it's John chapter 20 John chapter 20 and I want to give you a little background for for this chapter uh, the story we're about to read happened on the first Easter evening. Now, Jesus has already been resurrected. He's already talked to Mary Magdalene in the garden near the tomb. Uh, Peter and John had already seen that the stone had been rolled away, that the empty tomb and the grave closed. And on that evening, Jesus came to his disciples. And we read these words in John chapter 20, beginning with verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Well, most scholars believe that the Gospel of John was the last of the biblical Gospels to be written. So the story from John chapter 20 that we've just read was re recorded for a reason. And I think part of that reason was for John's first readers to understand what Jesus wants in and what Jesus wants for the church. I have to understand these people, uh, to, towards the conclusion of the first century, it, it might have been as many as 60 years after the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus. In these 60 years, at, at this time, these believers, they're trying to figure out what is the church supposed to be? What is it supposed to look like? What, what should we be doing? And I think there are some clues in this story that for them, but also I think there are some clues for us today. What is Jesus' plan for his church? Well, from this passage, I say, first of all, that Jesus wants us not to be people of fear, but to be people of peace and joy. Verse 19, we see that on the evening of the first day, the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. Uh, that's where Jesus found his disciples, behind locked doors because of fear. They, and now you have to understand why they were fearful. I mean, they just seen Jesus crucified. And the same people that crucified Jesus could have been outside waiting to grab them to crucify them as well. But Jesus doesn't want us to be people of fear because fear can paralyze. Fear can restrict us. Fear can prevent us from being all that God wants us to be, to be useful in the world for impact and for change. And the thing about fear is that fear hinders us, fear hampers us, fear holds us back from being all that God wants us to be. And the, and the, and the insidious thing about fear is that fear feeds on fear and becomes more fear. But Jesus doesn't want us to be like that. He wants, he doesn't want his disciples to be tense or to be neurotic or to be full of fear. In fact, I heard of a little boy here in, in Olathe that 
uh, they opened up baseball practice and he didn't want to leave the house. He didn't want to go to baseball practice because he is afraid that if he went outside and he practiced baseball, he'd get the coronavirus. And a lot of people, I think, in our world today, I think there's a lot of good people, a lot of our people in our churches, that quite honestly, this whole thing of the coronavirus and COVID-19 has filled them with fear. And if you don't, if you add on to that, what's happened with the, the protests, the marches, uh, the rioting, all of that, you put that all together. And I think that we're dealing with a lot of people that are dealing with fear. Then add on top of that, uh, what the future is going to hold for jobs. Will I have a job? Will there be jobs once everything is said and done? But you know, Jesus doesn't want us to be filled or directed or live our lives filled with fear. But he wants us to be people of peace and joy. It's interesting to me that two times in the span of three verses, Jesus said to his disciples, peace be with you. And when he said it the first time, the scripture tells us that then Jesus showed them his hands and showed them his side. And the disciples' response, as you see right there in the scripture, they were overjoyed. People of peace, people of joy. And I think that's what Jesus wants for you and me. And only Jesus can really give us that kind of peace. The, the peace that we can experience in our day, in our time, in the world that we find ourselves living in. A world that's sometimes filled with confusion and chaos and challenges and conflict. Jesus wants us to have his peace. In fact, in John chapter 14, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And so I think that we as a messengers of the gospel, the good news, need to be speaking into our people. Listen, folks, peace be with you. We are people of peace. And not only are we people of peace, but we also need to be people of joy. And you know, the interesting thing about people that are at peace and people that have joy, they're, they're attractive to people in the world. Even if they have no interest in Jesus Christ or going to church, people are drawn to people who are, are optimistic and positive and have a peace in their hearts, regardless of what they're going through, that have a joy that's unspeakable. Those type of people are attractive and winsome and compelling. And I believe that's what Jesus wants us to be in our world, to our neighbors, even though we might not be out running around like we usually do, to those that we come in contact with, even, even behind our mask, they need to be seeing a smile. Even behind our mask, they need to see a twinkle in our eyes to say, hey folks, it's all right, because Jesus is still with us. And as you start back and gather together, I pray that God would fill you with a spirit of optimism, a spirit of joy, a spirit of peace. I listened to one church last week, and, and it was their first Sunday back. They weren't in this state, but uh, uh, as the pastor was preaching, he, he just talked to them about all the great things that had happened during the lockdown. He introduced a young man who had started watching their service online with his girlfriend. And he came to faith in Jesus Christ. And then he said, and Tyler's here with us this morning. Had him stand up. And the people clapped and applauded. Talked about another lady who lives many states away who had been listening to their online service. And she had recommitted her life to Jesus Christ. And that week she had written a letter, which is unusual. But she wrote a letter instead of an email because in that letter she enclosed a sizable check to the church because of the change in her life. And we need to be sharing some good stories about how God has been working even during this lockdown about how God's still on the throne. Amen?
He hasn't given up control. And he wants us, he wants to fill us with his peace and his joy. But I also see from this passage that Jesus wants us not to be people of isolation. Now, this is kind of interesting. He doesn't want us to be people of isolation, but he wants us to be people of mission. Jesus found his disciples locked, locked up in a room, huddled together in quarantine, isolated from their world. And after Jesus said, peace be with you, he says, as a father has sent me, I am sending you. Now, the question that comes to my mind is, if Jesus is sending his disciples like the father had sent him, then the question is, is how did the father send Jesus? Does that make sense? He says, I want you to go as the father sent me, I'm sending you. Well, how did the father send him? Well, two things immediately come to my mind. First is, is that Jesus was sent in love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God so loved the world that he sent Jesus into the world in human flesh. Jesus was sent to the world because of love. And we who have received Jesus' love, Jesus is now sending us out into our world on a mission of love. He said, by this, the world will know you are my disciples. If you look a certain way, if you have a nice long red beard, if you, if, if, if you talk this way, you act this way. No, what did he say? He says, the people will know that you are my disciples by how you do what? Love one another. And he sends us out into our world just to love people. I like what the Apostle Paul says. He said, it's Christ's love that compels me. In other words, it was Christ's love that gave Paul his strength, his energy. He was motivated by, he was driven by Christ's love. He couldn't get over Christ's love. I like to think of it is that, that Christ's love was the Red Bull for, for uh, the monster drink for Paul's life. That's what gave him a passion and a drive and energy. And I pray that that's what drives us, that we who have received freely his love, that we are so filled with his love that we are just driven, compelled, motivated to love other people, to love our neighbors, to love people at the grocery store, to love people that we might walk by as we're just out walking, just to, to express God's love to them. That's how we should be living our lives. I, I tell you what, as now my life's changed a whole lot since this whole thing started because I was actually in Europe when uh, the shutdown started to happen. We were in Copenhagen, just finished the assembly, and we were getting ready to go to an, another country. And uh, they, well, we were actually going to Armenia when we got the word that after Armenia was Russia, and Russia had just declared that if you came into the country 14 days self quarantine, if you didn't, you could be arrested and put in prison up to five years. Well, I had no interest in being in a Russian prison for five years, and so we changed our plans and went to England to do British Isles North, British Isles South when everything shut down, and so we flew home. But one of, one of the prayers of my heart has been, as, as I'm not home very often until now, is that wherever I go, that the love of Christ would, would be seen in my life, would ooze out of me, whether it's a, uh, someone at a hotel, whether it's in a restaurant, whether it's standing in line at an airport, that I want to be consciously expressing and demonstrating to others the love of Christ. And I pray that in these days, when there's so much conflict that that you and I would be compelled by the love of Christ just to love everybody just to express a smile uh, a welcome we can't handshake with them we can't hug them so elbow bump them or something I don't know but just somehow say Lord love people through me and and may he do that in each one of our lives but not only was he sent in love, but Jesus was also sent on a mission. He, sent, he was sent with the purpose. As he began his ministry, Jesus 
took the scroll and read from the prophet Isaiah. It's recorded in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, where Jesus read these words, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus said, hey, this is my mission. I've come to reveal. I've come to rescue. I've come to redeem men and women, young people, boys and girls. I've come to preach the good news and freedom for the prisoners. Hey, we've got a great message to share with our world. Let's not get sidetracked. Let's tell them the good news of what Jesus Christ can, has done for us, but what he can also do in their hearts in their lives. And just as Jesus was sent on a mission, Jesus wants us as his disciples to be people of mission. That's what we're to be about. That's what we're here to do. And as Jesus received the authority from his father, Jesus gave his authority to us as a church. And we are to go out to preach, to teach, to love people, to not be isolated, protected, and sheltered. I think one of the positive things about this whole shutdown has been the church has left the building. I mean, it, it's not us gathering as much as it us scattered. And that we have probably, I know this, I've had more conversation with my neighbors in the last two months than I've had in the three years I've lived here. Um, because I'm home, one thing, but also because we're, we're all in the same boat. We're not going anywhere. And it gives us an opportunity to really reach out, to touch people, and to, to be sent on his mission, out from behind our locked doors. And let me encourage you, even as you start having services again, don't get locked into the building. Continue to have your, your Zoom things. Continue to have online presence. And I know that will require some new things for some of you. And I know it's not easy, but uh, just, just have someone sitting down there with an the iPhone recording you as you preach uh, so that that can still have an online presence so people can continue to listen, continue to keep the church going out, help your people to move into their homes for, for Bible studies and invite their neighbors to come in. And I think if we do that, then this whole pandemic and this shutdown that we've experienced could really turn out for the benefit of God's kingdom. I believe he's going to use it. I don't believe that he's up in heaven wringing his hands and saying, boy, did that thing blow up on me. No, I th think he's saying, go get them, church. Go get them. They're there. And stay working uh, to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, from this passage, he doesn't want us to be people of fear but people of peace and joy. My peace I give to you. He doesn't want us to be people of isolation, even though we've been shut up for a while. He wants us to be people of mission and people with a purpose and people filled with his love. The last thing I see is from the, the last verse in verse 22, where he doesn't want us to be people of emptiness, but he wants us to be people who are filled by the Spirit. Verse 22 says, and with that, he breathed on them, and he re said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, the truth of the matter is that you and I can attempt to do things, try to accomplish things within our own power, within our own resources, and, and most of us could actually write a sermon and preach it without any help from God at all. We just do it, but that's not the way he wants us to operate. He, he wants us to be people that are not doing in their things in their own strength or in their own power, but he wants us to do it through the power of his Holy Spirit living in us. And we are raised in a culture where we say, do your own thing. Uh, we're taught and encouraged to live life full of ourselves, but that's not what he wants for us. Jesus' plan is to fill us with his spirit, to empower us. <laughs> with his own presence so that we can see things and we can do things for his kingdom and his cause that we can never, ever 
see or do on our own. And so Jesus gave them his power by breathing into them the Holy Spirit. Immediately think about Genesis when God created man and he breathed into them life. Uh, my mind goes to Ezekiel and the, the story of the dry valley of dry bones and how the bones were put together and the ligaments and the tendons, but it was not until the breath of God came to them that they became a mighty army. And I pray that in these days that we would receive in a fresh and a new way the breath of God and that we would be filled with his Holy Spirit. It's interesting, my wife, um, she, she is referred to a physical therapist for something she is having uh, going on in one of her legs. Oh, the first time she went to physical therapy, you know what the person told her? Said, part of your problem is you're not breathing right. When she come home, came home and told me that, I thought, I thought your leg was hurting. What, what does that have to do with breathing? I said, I think we might be wasting our money if they're teaching you how to breathe and not helping your leg. And they said, you're not breathing deep enough. And so they spent a, t a part of that session giving her breathing lessons. You know what it taught me is that we are to breathe deep from our diaphragms. Most of us know that. Instead of our, just our shoulders going up and down, we're to breathe from our our diaphragm up to fill ourselves with the oxygen. You know, I, I thought about this. We can go along just, <sighs> but I think what he wants us to do is to breathe deeply of his Holy Spirit and say, breath of heaven, just fill me. Breathe in, Holy Spirit, I receive you. I receive you. I I breathe in your spirit. I breathe out your grace. I breathe in your spirit. I breathe out your grace. And in this day when there is a lot of tension, uh, you, I, I admire all of you pastors. I know it's not been easy. I thought this was going to be a nice little vacation. But boy, has we worked hard. You've worked hard. I, I've been with you because uh, for the month of May, I've been preaching for a local congregation and videoing the tapes and sending it to them. And uh, you've been working hard. I've watched some of you and uh, what you're doing, devotions and prayer meetings and board meetings, all of it by Zoom. Thank you for what you're doing. And now as we start to reopen, it's a whole new set of issues that we're dealing with. And I pray that in these days, that you would take the time just to breathe in and receive afresh and anew the power of his Holy Spirit. And that he would enable each and every one of you to do things that you never thought you could do. And to see things that you never thought you'd see, because it's by His grace and through the empowerment of His Holy Spirit. So may God bless each one of you, and may He impart His spiritual life into you through His Holy Spirit. May He give you new power and a new anointing and a freshness as you go back. Don't be discouraged now, okay? It's not going to be the same as it was before. Don't be discouraged. It's going to be better. Just hang on and just breathe in his spirit, knowing that we are to be people not of fear, but of peace and joy. We've got a good message to give to our world, not to be people of isolation, but help our people to continue to be people of mission and purpose and filled with his love, sharing that love with everybody we come in contact with and doing it not in our own strength and our own power but doing it through the presence and the power of God's Holy Spirit. Amen? Well, I'd like to pray for you before uh, we change order a little bit. Could we pray together? Father, we just thank you so much for each and every one of these that are on this Zoom call tonight. 
We thank you for their lives. We thank you for their ministries. We thank you for their service to you and your kingdom. We thank you, Lord, for, for how they've learned some new things in this time. Quite honestly, I'd never been on a Zoom call until now. I have not personally recorded a whole bunch of sermons <laughs> of preaching to a camera just to send off. But Lord, we thank you for the ways, the creative ways that our pastors have been serving you. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon their lives. We pray for a fresh anointing and outpouring of your Holy Spirit upon them, upon their marriages, upon their families, upon their congregations. May it be a new day of your Spirit doing new things and great and mighty things as we serve you. Lord, help us to keep our eyes focused upon you, not on the number of people who are coming or the people who aren't there or or any of those things, but Lord, keep our eyes focused on you, and may we be a source of encouragement, may we be a source of joy and peace to people as we point them to you. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, provide for each one of our pastors here physically, Lord, those that have had surgery, those whose spouses have recently had surgery, Lord, we just pray for your healing touch upon all of their bodies. Mm -hmm that you would give them new strength and new energy to serve you. We pray for their families. As uh, families have been together now more than they've ever been, Lord, we pray that you would just draw us closer to one another. Even as things start to open up a little bit, that there would be a, a closeness and a unity in our families. And then, Lord, we pray for your financial provision. Mm -hmm. We know that many of our pastors are bivocational and Maybe some of their jobs have been, they've been either laid off or terminated. Lord, would you just provide for their every need financially? Mm -hmm. You are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord God who provides. And we pray that you would provide for every pastor mm -hmm. on this call and on the Joplin district. And then, Lord, I pray for our congregations and for all of our people. May you give them a new, new eyes to see the ministries that they could have outside the church well not outside the church outside the building they're still the church lord would you just help them to be engaged in serving you be people on a mission and so lord as things uh, start back up we pray for your protecting hand upon all of our people and that you would use us for your honor and your glory as we serve you share your love and are filled with your peace and your joy through your Holy Spirit. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless all of you. <laughs>